Welcome to the session on uh, facing up to the economic slowdown. My name is Robert Greenhill. I'm Managing Director and Chief Business Officer of the World Economic Forum. Clearly with a global crisis of the magnitude and scope that we've experienced over the last uh, several months now, uh, no particular playbook uh, can simply be referred to uh, with any hope that it's going to provide a clear sense as to what's happening now and, and what's happening going forward. Indeed, this is, as Klaus Schwab refers to, the, the first tr uh, transformational crisis of a globalized economy. And therefore, in this case, looking at the evolving situation in a very pragmatic and realistic fashion, actually seeing what's truly happening by geography, what's truly happening by sector, and what are the emerging strategies or the lessons learned or the opportunities, uh, and understanding and synthesizing that real time is perhaps more important now than, than at any point in the last decade or more. And in a sense, uh, that's really what the forum is all about. It's not a forum for ideology, it's a forum for reality, uh, for real conversations about what's happening out there, what is the state of the world today, and what can be practi practically and pragmatically done to help improve the state of the world. So I'm delighted to uh, be able to, for the next 45 minutes, engage in a conversation with yourselves and our distinguished panelists here, uh, the co-chairs of uh, this Latin America Summit, uh, to discuss uh, their views and perspectives on what's actually happening out there and to provide perspectives from different geographical and different sectoral uh, and different ownership structure of perspectives. And to start, I would like to, uh, first of all, invite uh, Ricardo Vilela Marino, who's the Chief Executive Officer for Latin America of Atau Unibanco, and one of our young global leaders as well, to provide his perspective from his sectors and his geographic perspective. Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for giving me the floor. I think uh, regarding this uh, topic, the central reality that I want to stress is that Latin America has become a net exporter of financial stability. To the world one at a time, and when we see country after country, especially in Eastern Europe and other regions of the world, asking for help from the IMF. You ask about uh, which sectors are performing better under today's uh, difficult circumstances. As chairman of the Latin American Bank Federation, I dare say that uh, banking is one of such sectors. I in some ways, I think it's amazing that it should be so, as banks have been not only uh, at the eye of the storm, but actually they have been the eye, meaning that they have been the main source uh, of North American European financial storm. The major difference, uh, in my view, between our situation and theirs is that here the banking system is intact and working normally. We had so far no bank failures, we had uh, no toxic assets, we had no massive transfers of public money to the banks, and so far we had no bank runs of any kind. This time, in my view, we're importing the crisis from, for, from abroad. The only financial problems uh, that we have had are the unavoidable consequences of the negative developments uh, in the global financial system, meaning uh, two examples that, that to illustrate this are the foreign shrinking trade uh, financing and uh, the difficulty to uh, refinance loans to the private companies. But thanks to the accumulation of foreign reserves, uh, central banks in the region uh, have been able to relatively ease both problems. In contrast to, to what is happening uh, in some advanced economies, Latin American banks are quite well capitalized. In reality, uh, in many countries in Latin America, capital adequacy is ranging between 15 to 17 percent. This, this means two times the basal requirements. Likewise, uh, return on assets is around 2.5% and it reaches 25% uh, on equity. Cover ratio, for example, is north of 100%. Liquidity is high, more than 25%, and leverage is low, around 10 to 1 ratio, like Pre President Lula told us today. Although the economic slowdown 
has somewhat increased the rate of non-performing loans, it still lies at uh, relatively low levels. So when we, we look uh, to the region, and also when you ask uh, the question of possible winners uh, coming out of this crisis, I think it's a different way of saying that crises are not only about destruction of value. They might become opportunities as well, depending on the quality of our reaction. A case in point that I would like to share uh, here today is the recent merger between Itaú and Unibanco, creating a huge banking conglomerate that's now number 10th in the world, the first time ever that a bank from the Southern Hemisphere has reached such a position. Although the merger was not you know, a product of this crisis, it is undeniable that the sense of urgency created by this crisis helped provide the final push to conclude something that was already in the cards. We have, we, have, we have no illusions. There is a lot of room for improvement, improving the way we do business uh, in the region and could generate opportunities for expansion. For example, over the last 10 years, almost 90 million people in Latin America overcame poverty. Part of those gains might be affected for sure if the crisis is allowed to drag for too long. However, a considerable uh, part of the gains is still out there and should provide excellent chances for growth. Right now, in Latin America, only 36% uh, of the families have access to banking services. On average, there are only eight branches for every 100,000 people in the region. And domestic credit for the private sector is quite low. It's below 39% of GDP as compared to 175% of GDP in other advanced economies. I think it's clear that as we move to increase the share of small and medium enterprises with access to bank credit, and as we cut down risk spreads and intermediation costs alongside with interest rates cuts by central banks, I have no doubt that we'll be uh, acting as powerful engines of the economic recovery. For us uh, in FELABAM, Federation of Latin American of Banks, winners should be defined not only in terms of profits, but above all, in terms of services rendered to society as a whole. In that sense, uh, might say that we are proud that the banking system in Latin America is helping common citizens to improve the quality of their lives. In doing so, at the same time, we're making available to society one or more effective tools to generate jobs and to overcome the downturn. In other words, if I can rephrase that, is that banks in the region, Latin American region, are not contributing to the overall problem. They are very much an indispensable part of its solution. Thank you. One of the things that's always interesting is what are the counterintuitive uh, perspectives? And one of the things that's come out very clearly in the last 36 hours has been the degree to which Latin America, which in, in previous economic cycles was either a source of a financial crisis with the banking and debt crisis of the 80s, or was infected uh, by the global contagion around the time of the Asian and, and Russian debt crisis of the late 90s is actually in a very different space right now. And in fact, at the private sector level is uh, showing a degree of stability and resilience in the financial sector that other uh, northern economies uh, aren't experiencing. And the fact that President Lula uh, announced today the um, contribution of Brazil to the IMF is um, a very different uh, situation than was the case a few years ago that many uh, observing from outside might have expected. Let me turn to, to uh, a different sector, and Marcelo Odebrecht, who's the chief executive officer of the engineering construction portion of, of Odebrecht and, and president of uh, Odebrecht Group for, for, for Brazil. Marcelo, how, how do you see the situation broadly in Brazil and Latin America, and also from your sector? Uh, what do you see as the challenges? What do you see as uh, potential opportunities 
uh, in this uh, present situation. Just, sorry, just try to emphasize was Ricardo just said, I mean, we don't have the disease of the crisis. I mean, we have the effect of it. Just to have a quick view about uh, the sectors that we are, take the case of petrochemical. Petrochemical in, the, in Brazil, uh, we are based in Brazil. There is a drop in oil price that benefit our client. What to have? Lack of credit for the client. So what's happened after the, uh, what's because of the crisis, there is lack of external financing. Our, our clients don't get credit, so the, it, that affects demand. You take the case of the ethanol business that we are. I mean, the, the pr ethanol business in Brazil is basically an uh, internal business. The demand is internally. The price of the, the gas, the price of the oil, the price of the ethanol at the pump station are still the same. What's the problem? Liquidity. Companies have no liquidity, so they are like make liquidation of the stocks. So back to credit. We have credit problem, then we have a demand problem. Take the case of real estate. Uh, real estate that we are in Brazil, I'd say that real estate was probably the only uh, sector of the productive uh, sector that was speculating. Real estate was in a speculative way. If there is one fault of uh, the productive sector in all this mess, is the real estate. I mean, in Brazil, we probably sold much more than we could. We have, uh, we have tried to sell. And I think we have, we have a major problem in the real estate when you look for the medium and high class. Business. But again, in the real estate is a place where you have a huge opportunity, that popular housing. I mean, we can build a lot of demand. The government is trying to build a lot of demand. And that's not only Brazil. There is also a huge program of popular housing in Peru. Venezuela is also trying to do that and Colombia. So there is huge opportunity for popular housing. And that's how you can bring demand back. And, and then you are going to construction infrastructure. Uh, that's where we work throughout Latin America. That's, if there is a sector that's a dream time, is the infrastructure. We are living a dream time. I mean, we still cannot cope with the demand for infrastructure. I mean, people are still investing a lot. Infrastructure is a long-term investment. Infrastructure is the only sector, maybe, that doesn't lack credit. Why that? Because credits from the infrastructure usually come from multilateral. Infrastructure was the only place where market was not, it's just a small portion of the overall credit, capital market. So most of the credits in Brazil come from NDS, and outside would come from ECAs and multilaterals. So because we don't have a credit problem infrastructure, the governments are putting a lot of money in infrastructure. It's a long-term investment, so the companies are not stopping. So it's a dream time for, for infrastructure. So overall, uh, what we have is not lack of demand, especially in Latin America. What we have is lack of confidence outside that gives us to lack of credit, and that affects the demand. And, but in Latin America, we have plenty of opportunities to build our demand. We have lack of infrastructure, we have lack of popular housing, uh, we have social problems. So there is a lot of opportunities that we can build our, our demand. But I'd like to highlight also that what we have, and a lot of people tell us that we have lack of governance. I have heard a lot of people telling that this crisis has a lot to do with lack of governance. What I do believe is that we, lack, we have lack of ownership. Because uh, what we didn't see is that the companies, apparently the companies in Europe and the company US, apparently they don't have owners. What you see is that in Latin America, most of the companies, they have defined control. And that makes a huge difference. And just to give you an example, which is the only one bank in the world, outside Latin America, that get well out of this crisis? Was Santander, and he's probably the only one bank that has a defined control outside Brazil. And the reason the Brazilian banks didn't get in trouble is that most of them have defined control. So I think that instead of talking about lack of governance, <laughs> what we need is lack, we need owners. And I think, so we have the demand and we have ownership. So Latin America has all the chances to emerge out of this crisis better than we are.
Let me uh, t turn to, to Lord Levine, who has a, a distinguished career in both the public and the private sectors, is uh, in addition to being chairman of, of Lloyd's, also engaged as a chairman of the board or board member of a number of uh, distinguished global organizations. Uh, Lord Levine, could you provide your, your perspective in terms of how you seeing, see both the reality and the perceptions of the reality globally and how that seems to be affecting uh, opportunities for businesses? Well, thank you, Bob, and uh, what a great pleasure it is to be back here in Rio. And if we come here and we, we look at the uh, context of this discussion this evening, and people can say, well, are things really any different here? Well, in my view, they are. Why? Well, the first example of that was this morning. Um, we heard uh, President Lula speak this morning, uh, and, and uh, what an inspirational speech. Maybe if we had a few more politicians like that on the other side of the world, we wouldn't be in quite such uh, the mess we found ourselves in recently. Um, I'm chairman of Lloyd's. That's not Lloyd's Bank. It's a completely different organization, nothing to do with us. Um, but it's Lloyd's Insurance. Reinsurance in Brazil was liberalized uh, 18 months ago. We took full advantage of that. Result, this year, our premium income here in Brazil is up by 79%. And we don't see that anywhere else in the world. And what we need to understand is that so much of this has come about because of what we are told and what we read. How much of this actually do we need to put down to the media and how much is for real? We had, many of you may have seen the first uh, uh, manifestation of this problem in the UK was a small mortgage bank called uh, Northern Rock. Not that big, but all of a sudden it was on the TV screens all day, every day of people queuing outside the, outside the bank um, to collect their money. Now, their money was guaranteed up to $50,000. I, I doubt that more than about 5 or 10% of the depositors had more than that there. They saw it on the television. They thought they all had to go. They all queued up. The result was inevitable. And we also have the problem we have all institutions, even all sectors, being tarred with the same brush. I even heard somebody this morning say, well, of course, the uh, financial services industry, the banks and the insurers, are in terrible shape and have caused a problem. Well, the banks, uh, with the notable exception of uh, our friend from uh, Unibanco Itaú and the banks here, uh, the banks internationally did a lousy job. But uh, the insurers, of which I'm proud to represent one, didn't do a lousy job. And before anybody says, what about AIG? If you look at AIG and what happened to AIG, this had absolutely nothing to do with their insurance business. Their insurance business was fine. They decided that wasn't exciting enough and to get into something which probably very few of them understood, and the result was, I'm afraid, inevitable. So who are the winners? Who are the winners in the West out of this? Well, we find in Europe, for example, surprise, surprise, who is actually doing well despite what has happened? Walmart and McDonald's. Why? Because people are worried about spending money and rather than go out and buy expensive things and go to expensive restaurants, they shop very carefully. We heard uh, President Lula this morning talking about the extraordinary spikes and falls in the oil price and the food price. But now that is over, they seem to be relatively stable. So where do we, where do we try to win? We look at sectors and we look at regions. Now clearly, Latin America is a region which is getting more and more attention and from the relative stability of this part of the world, we see that people are beginning to take notice, finally. I've just been, I was three weeks ago in China, I sit on the board of the second largest bank in China, which by market cap is now the second largest bank in the world. Interestingly, 10 years ago, there wasn't a single Chinese bank in the top 50, they now rank one, two, and three. Although I'm sure that Itao, Unibanco are soon going to catch them up. And they were very, very worried there. I was there in December. They were extremely worried in China about what was going to happen to their economy. Now they're seeing things slowly are starting to look perhaps not quite so bad. And they suddenly realize that if their export market has dried up, which clearly has done to the states, they've got a huge market. Where? At home. They have got 1.3 billion people, of whom probably 700 million 
rarely buy anything. So they've now decided to stimulate the rural economy, which is a huge economy. And that is going to start to, to move things forward. So I think that the most important thing I take out of all of this is that perception, as uh, we've just heard from Bob, perception is so important. And we have to make the perception match the reality, which is that the whole world has been through a very nasty shock. The Western world, a much nastier shock than everybody else. And as the president told us this morning, people are getting things into the right perspective. And I think the one lesson I would take for this is don't necessarily believe or follow everything you read. Follow your instincts and what you see in your own businesses and your own sectors, because that's likely to be a lot more realistic. Thank you. Very, very interesting fact-based positive perspectives in terms of if you look at the, the three dimensions of, of regions, certain regions and Latin America does seem to be one of them are more resilient. Certain sectors, uh, even in, in the financial services industry more broadly, particularly insurance, but also in the, in the dimension of time, that although people are still very cautious, there is a sense of um, people and industries getting their footing in a way that perhaps wasn't as obvious a few months ago, albeit uh, in, in certain sectors and in certain geographies, still a, a lot of work to do before uh, people can be absolutely certain that that footing will remain solid. In terms of, of continuing to provide that, that global perspective on both Latin America and, and, and the um, economic situation as a whole, I'd like now to turn to uh, Tim Flynn, who is the chairman of KPMG uh, International and has been obviously following this issue very closely, both from the perspective as a sector, but also from the perspective of, of clients, which are in virtually every sector around the globe. Tim, how do you see the situation? Well, I, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I would echo many of the comments made already. Um, I do really also very much believe, in a sense of optimism, uh, and that everything is not as bad as one might read, is, is a really important takeaway. Uh, and I, believe, I agree with the infrastructure point in the banking community here, it's very important to help lead us out of this. I think uh, the consumer by themselves is not going to lead us out of where we are. And we're going to need a balance of stimulus and government spending and stimulus packages to help support and get the economies back going again. And ultimately, the consumer will come back. But maybe I would um, just focus on, on a broader perspective for a moment. Clearly, every country, every business, every government, Every individual has been impacted in some way in what's happened. And, and I think it clearly has been a shock to the system, which really began last September and October with that weekend with Lehman's and AIG and just the total freezing up of the markets in the West and the ripple effect that that had. And coming out of that, companies as well as individuals basically stopped buying. It was like the blood flow, flow stopped in the body and the heart stopped pumping. It, just, it went into shock. And we've slowly recovered from that. We've learned what's happened. We've put in stimulus packages, $5 trillion around the world. And I believe we're beginning to stabilize and get a foundation which the economies will recover and we will move forward. And if you look at sectors, let me just talk about maybe some of the attributes that I think the winners will have as that come out of this. Uh, first of all, I think it's very easy in a time of crisis to really take a very short-term point of view and to stop spending, stop investing, and really pull way back and just duck for cover, if you will, and wait for the storm to go away. I think that can be a necessary beginning of, of, to assess the situation, but one must continue to invest. It must take a longer-term point of view, moving away from the next quarter and looking at the next year. The economies will recover. The consumer will come back. The fundamentals will matter going forward. Capital will flow again. So what are you doing in your organization to prepare yourself for the turnaround? Uh, people, the successful winners, are evaluating every aspect of their business, leaving no question unturned. They're engaging the entire organization, not just senior management, but great ideas come throughout the organization. And they're engaging the entire organization to reassess how things are done, to come up with new ideas and implement those. They're getting back to their core businesses and, and spinning off things that are not core to what they do. There also, I think, is a really 
tendency in this situation to look at your cost structure and cut cost. It's something you can do tangibly, you can see it, and you can really make an impact. And that's important. But I think more important is to focus on what are the revenue opportunities, what are the growth opportunities, and how are you going to invest in those for the eventual turnaround. So while you have to look at cost containment for the short term, put as much focus on what are the revenue opportunities and the growth opportunities as you go forward. Another thing that's critically important is to assess your risk architecture. We've seen what's happened in the unforeseen risk in the financial sector. But what are the unforeseen risks within your sector? What lessons can be learned? How do you identify risk in your organization? How do you then put controls in to mitigate that risk and report upon those risks and make sure that people understand the risks they're taking and the complexity of doing business today and really understand that in your business model? And finally, I would just say that, that um, if you look at this crisis, and it truly is a crisis, and it's very scary at times, I am an optimist to heart, and I do believe that we'll come out of this stronger, both as nations, as businesses, and as people. And I think those, those who don't miss the opportunity to take advantage of this crisis and rethink every aspect of their business and capitalize an opportunity will be the winners as we move forward. It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, a, a number of the, the points that, uh, Tim, you were just making in terms of this, while dealing with the short term, continuing to prepare for the, for the long term, and we actually heard from Petrobras earlier today, where they're actually, through this uh, challenging time, continuing to invest $100 million a day in, in new investment opportunities, some 36, 35, 36 billion dollars over the next year as part of a five-year plan, because they're actually preparing now for energy requirements coming up three or five years from now and see this as a, as a real moment of opportunity. The other element, too, of while at the same time looking forward, being very aware of the different risks and the complexities of the risks that businesses are facing today is, is probably more, more essential now than ever. I'd like now to turn to, to the last uh, speaker who uh, is the founder and chief executive officer of the SAS Institute. And Jim Goodnight has uh, been a, a leader of his organization for over 30 years, I believe 33 years of consecutive growth and profitability. So Jim, you've seen a lot of different cycles, you've seen a lot of different challenges, and you've also seen it from the perspective of a private company. Uh, maybe you could share some of your perspectives from your industry, but also uh, based on that ownership structure. Well, it's certainly a good time to be a private company. You don't have Wall Street telling you what to do. You don't have to worry about quarterly profits, and you can focus more on the long term. You know, most of the R&D that we do, it's, it's a, a two-year cycle by the time we uh, begin new, new projects, new solutions, new products. It, it, it takes about two years to get it all developed and tested and, and rolled out to the customer. So uh, right now we're you know quite busy at, at, in our R&D efforts, uh, trying to be prepared for, uh, for for the new demands. And quite frankly, uh, th this past year in Brazil, uh, our, our growth was 30 percent uh, year over year for, for last year, and we're anticipating at, at least 20 percent year over year growth this year. So it's uh, it's it's times like uh, like this that companies really do need to, to turn inward. I think that as Tim was mentioning to look inward and say, well, what can we do to improve our business? How can we select uh, better uh, targets for our marketing campaign? How can we optimize our processes? You know, if, if you've got large inventories, how, how do you optimize your inventory or your spare parts? Uh, and, and how do you make sure that the people you're loaning money to are credit worthy? So there's, there's so much you can do now that times are a little slower that you just didn't have time to do when you were making lots of money and you didn't worry about it. So we're in a, just a great position right now to, to meet these kind of demands. Not only a, a fascinating perspective, but actually uh, you were able to make Ricardo jealous with the 30% growth in the year on year. It, if, when we look at over the, uh, the statements, uh, with Ricardo mentioning uh, the strength of, of the financial sector uh, in Brazil and in Latin America generally, and the continued growth that's going there. Mar Mar Marcelo was underlining the fact that for the construction industry and also for, for the energy 
production industries uh, demand is still there there's a challenge of credit but also uh, both of you mentioned the fact that there's a lot of, of untapped uh, potential demand here at a very concrete level that affects people's lives that uh, government programs can actually help uh, access a in a relatively uh, quick fashion you mentioned to the issue of social housing Lord Levine uh, reminded us of the fact that it's very important for us to understand the self-fulfilling prophecies that may be out there in terms of people reading and reacting to bad news, which may in fact be exaggerated in its impact, unless in fact it is acted upon, and that in fact certain sectors in certain regions are continuing to perform very strongly, and that more broadly there does seem to be a, a certain stabilization, albeit uh, fragile. I think Tim underlined a, a number of the key lessons uh, to be learned and applied by CEOs uh, across different industries, and I think, Jim, you provided a a, a very thoughtful perspective of how corporations with leaders who are prepared to actually take a long-term view can actually use the moment we're in right now to, to renew internally, to Im improve operations, to focus on things that were more difficult to focus on when top-line growth was, was all-consuming, and actually position the organizations from the human capital and organizational perspective to be, be stronger than, than before this downturn. Let us now turn it over to, to the, to the um, audience. And let me invite you to, to raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself, and, and I'd ask you to either provide a, a, a brief comment or a question. And in either case, uh, perhaps of, of no more than 30 seconds, and what I'd like to do is, is suggest that we take two or three of these, and then um, actually I'd like to turn it back to the panelists for their reactions to it. And we have microphones available uh, perfectly. Please, over here. Let me perhaps ask the, uh, the, the first question while we're, while the, for, to, for going over to the microphone, which is we talked a lot about the, the opportunities uh, right now that you see in, in, in Latin America. Given the challenge, let me just ask you, how would you compare the state of the crisis today compared to other crises that have been faced by the Latin American economies over the last 10 or 20 years? Because we talk about globally this being the most challenging economic crisis since the 1930s. Would that be the case for Latin America, or how would this so far compare to others that have been faced here? Thank you. I think that, I think that the global crisis that we are seeing today is has, a, has no precedence. Uh, it's completely different uh, from what we've seen in the past. That's, w that's why we need a uh, global perspective on this crisis. That's why we're gathered here to discuss this crisis. Actually, it's like antibiotics. The, the, the time you use one uh, medicine, uh, you know, the, the disease has changed. And this one has uh, we've never seen so deep. And then we don't know how long we will take. Uh, that's the reality we have to face. Actually, the only certainty here about this crisis is the uncertainty of its crisis. So as Lula was saying, we all have to be humble to try to think together as the, the world seems to be falling apart. We should get together and cooperate to see how we're going to tackle uh, this, this challenge uh, that uh, we are facing. And the, the difference here that in the past, especially in the 80s, uh, the crisis used to come from abroad, from, uh, from actually from Latin America. Uh, and now we are importing the crisis. The crisis is happening, is beginning in the center of the system and going to the periphery. In the past, they, they were happening in the periphery and contaminating the center of the system. So it's completely, completely different, it's upside down. So we need to have a different thinking model, mental problem solving in order to tackle this one. But uh, the good news, is, as we said here, uh, uh, we have capable people, we have uh, governments willing to face it, the private sector also well engaged, and civil society also involved in brainstorming how we can keep the economy moving, how can we leverage on the domestic market that we have here in Latin America, how can we invest more in infrastructure, in production, in education, in order to go over this one, because in my view, it's not a structural crisis in Latin America. It's a purely cyclical contraction that we're going through, basically through the contagion, the, the usual channels that we had, drop in world trade, drop in commodity prices, drop 
uh, in um, uh, international liquidity, for example, in terms of credit, as some, some people mentioned here. So therefore, uh, we, we need to, uh, as, as a continent, do more trade with each other, for example, uh, try to think out of the box, and also, uh, in order to perform and go out of this one, thinking about the long term, because the only certainty is the crisis, they end. They end, but we don't know how and when. So we have to do our share of things, thinking not only the financial side, but also the social and environmental. So that's my view. Which actually was an important element that came up in some of the conversations uh, this morning, which is making sure we deal with the economic crisis in such a way that also doesn't compromise, but perhaps accelerates the resolution of some of these broader social uh, climate change and other challenges as well. Marcelo, just briefly, how, how is, is your industry seeing this crisis compared to ones in the past? Would you, obviously it's different, but is it more severe in its impact, less severe in its impact? that way I mean the the crisis that we've seen before was born and was felt by the productive sector of the economy I myself is an engineer I was formed in 92 and by the time I I, I came out of the university probably I was the only one that uh, went to work into construction probably all my my colleagues went to the banking sector nowadays what we see is that uh, for the first time the problems are not in the productive sector we really can see the demand. We really can see solutions. I mean, uh, we look just maybe one year, two years out of this credit crunch crisis, and we see that the, the world is coming. I mean, and uh, so we, what we really see now is, for the first time, is a crisis, a crisis in the financial sector. So, and I think that's the major difference. I mean, we still lack, we, we lack of engineers. If you can find me 200 good engineers, I'll hire them today. So for the first time, the, the, pro the problems are not in the product sector. If you could briefly introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manuel Molano from the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness. I, I wanted to ask you uh, about what, how do you envision the role of the rating agencies in the future? Um, to cite one case, uh, one of the uh, Mexican companies that made a huge mistake with derivatives had uh, uh, investment grade rating the day before it applied for, for chapter 11 type of procedure. So um, I think that's a market with huge uh, uh, moral hazard that's a market where, where we need more information and better information so people stop uh, sitting on the cash and, and put it into T-bills and, and, and really start investing. I think it's important both to lead our way out, out of the crisis and to make the system less prone to this kind of crisis. So, so I'd like to hear uh, your comments about this. Before I, I turn to panelists, is there any other uh, people who would like the gentleman here, please? And then the gentleman. Hello, uh, my name is <coughs> Jorge Rasuris from uh, Selfin Capital, an investment bank in Chile. I would like to put an optimistic uh, word. We've heard the whole day talking about crisis. I think that our friends from the north, especially, they really are immersed in a, in a very serious crisis that nobody could ever imagine. But I would like to put a positive view <clears throat> For the first time, Latin America today doesn't have to look to New York to finance infrastructure projects. Doesn't have to look to New York to, to get capital for the companies. Doesn't have to, to look to New York to issue debt. <clears throat> Our company last year got a special prize from Euromoney and IFR because we placed the first uh, cross-border bond. A Chilean risk company raised solace in Peru. Well, that wasn't a, a very special deal, it was just a bond. But why the price? Because what we see is an integration of financial markets in Latin America. Chile has more than $100 billion in, in the, in only in the pension fund system. Peru has around 30. Colombia, another 30. In Brazil, you have $700 billion from pension and, and savings. So if we interconnect and we use the, this 
crisis in the north to interconnect our, our financial markets, we will be able to get through and not look at the moment that the United States or Europe will come out of this crisis. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. You. Let me just ask the gentleman here and then I'll come to the for Marcel Odebrecht. Marcel, the way you, you said that companies should have owners, it left me a little bit uh, shocked because a person that defends capital markets for 52 years, it looks to me that you don't believe in corporations, you don't believe in capital markets, you believe only in companies that have owners. Perhaps the word owners is too strong. Perhaps what you are going to try to say that the companies de de depend on command, not necessarily ownership, because you could have a, a public company with a certain degree of control, but they need to have con control and command. And what I don't agree that the company needs to be owners in order to succeed in crisis. What they need is command, is a firm decision, is a, is a board that will support the decisions to be taken. I'd like to, to hear your opinions on that. Very good. So, I mean, th three, three questions. The, the first one on the issue of other rating agencies is part of the broader issue of how to restore trust in uh, for people who are looking to, to move from cash back into an, in investment vehicles, either as individuals or organizations. The second uh, question or opportunity in terms of is there now a chance to have integrated financial markets in, in Latin America that actually are taking the growing savings to be pension funds, but other forms of savings, and and um, providing them as sources of, of capital for investment in, in Latin America. And then thirdly, the broader issue of what does this mean for the appropriate structure of corporations? And in fact, the the, the, this, the concept of, of corporate models with owners dis differentiated um, from, from management. And let me turn for the first one. Who would, who would like to, to comment on the issue of, of, of rating agencies and also in the restoration of trucks? Lord Levine, would you like to? Well, I think uh, it's not very difficult to say that the rating agencies are the organizations everybody loves to hate. And uh, we don't have to just look to the recent crisis. If you think back to the time of Enron, Enron got a AAA rating from the uh, agencies uh, a few weeks before it went bust. And why we didn't learn from that and do something about it, I, I don't understand. And they, the, the, the business model is a very strange one. When you as an investor want to have uh, a target rated, and who pays for the rating? Well, the target does. Now, the, the, the uh, conflict of interest in that is huge. And I'm very surprised that the G20, which said they were gonna talk about a, a lot about rating agencies, didn't say very much about it at the end of the day. And I think that is one problem which is still not yet properly fixed. And could I just make a, a brief comment on, on the last question about owners and uh, shareholders? Uh, the first company I worked for, uh, which I eventually went on to run, became a publicly quoted company. The vast majority of the shares were held by investment institutions and individuals. But we had one very wise uh, older director on the board who said the reason that this company succeeds is because the management are owners too. In other words, they were shareholders. They were very much in the minority, but they had a large part of their own capital tied up in that business. And so what they were doing was working very much in the interests, not just of the business and the management, but of the owners, because they knew as it prospered, they would prosper too. And so I, I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive at all. Marcelo, did you want to, or, or Jim, uh, comment on that perspective of, of ownership structure? No, I'd just like to add, when I mean owner, I mean someone that is committed to the long term to the company. I don't think that a shareholder that uh, has a, uh, a share today and is going to sell tomorrow, uh, I, I consider that to be an owner. And that's, that's the main problem. What I have seen, and I have many discussions with some executives of, uh, or what we call corporations or executive from companies and banks that has uh, no defined control, no defined owners, was the fact that they were concerned only about their bonus and they're not concerned about the perpetuity of the company. If they make as much money as they could in one, two years, get the bonus, the one who is going to receive the loss will not be them. 
will be the long-term owners. So, I mean, when you don't have someone that has a long-term commitment to the company, that can command, that can make a decision, that can control the process, what you have is that you have like a, you are in Las Vegas. People make as much money as they can because the one that's going to burden the loss will not be there. So that's what I mean, owner. I mean, you should have someone that is, has a long-term commitment to the company. If they are the executives or if they are a group of people, that's mean, but they should have long-term commitment to the company. And then, Tim? Yeah, I'll just briefly talk about the, um, the rating agencies. We do a lot of work in the, for the Basel II, and especially in Europe. And uh, so we're involved in all the risk computations that, that many of the banks have been using. And the problem we had uh, th this, uh, this, this last uh, go around was that the fact that the rating agencies like Moody's had been paid by the banks to rate these specific pieces of paper. And that it is a terribly bad conflict because the, the banks would simply let it be known that they were gonna shop till they got the right, the right uh, rating on these, uh, on these pieces of paper. So the banks, uh, you know, fooled themselves into believing that they had AAA paper uh, for some of these mortgage-backed securities, and, w and the underlying assets just were not there. So I, I clearly think we do have a major problem uh, with the with the uh, rating agencies. Uh, with regard, uh, you know, I, 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 the ownership. So often, uh, I know I was talking in Davos about the fact that SAP had just announced 3,000 layoffs and their stock price went up 6%. Now, that, that bothers me that I, I, the, the officers of the company would get a reward by maintaining, uh, get, getting a higher stock price by ter terminating people. I think it's socially not responsible. So, uh, you know, when this uh, particular, uh, you know, potential slowdown occurred, uh, for my company, I made it very clear we're not going to lay anybody off. That is our policy. We will not lay anybody off. And, and everybody that works there, of course, is just working just a little bit harder now because they, they feel really proud to work for a company that has that policy. Because if, if my profits go down a few points, I don't care. It's, I, we make enough profits already anyway. Because the share price on Wall Street is not dependent upon the exact percentage of profit I make each year. So I have much more freedom and flexibility, whereas a lot of the publicly traded uh, CEOs have this obligation to keep that price up. And if they have to lay off and decimate five or 6,000 people at a time, it doesn't bother them at all. They just do it and don't have much respect for those. The op on the question about the capital markets and, and is it an opportunity, I think coming out, as I mentioned before, coming out of this crisis, uh, people can drive change today that a year ago would have been unheard of, unthoughtable. And so I think clearly shifting the capital centers of the world, opening up more integrated financial globally, having new centers of access to capital, using different means to do it, different models are clearly there. And I think Latin America is well, Latin America is well positioned to do some things differently going forward that maybe they couldn't have done before, but this crisis now makes it possible. Just if I may add on the ownership uh, question, I think uh, difficult uh, for every entrepreneur to become you know, a big owner and uh, have a substantial uh, private company with economic impact and to have this sensation of ownership. But understanding the spirit of the of the conversation here, I think we can synthesize this ownership uh, feeling through what is culture, it's mindset. Culture you can really repeat and walk the talk inside the company and create uh, uh, this uh, ownership uh, uh, feeling. The other is alignment uh, of incentives um, in order to synthesize this ownership and give accountability to the people, especially the main leaders that work uh, in the company. Uh, aligning uh, their interests with the shareholders' interests and uh, building incentives that are adjusted to risk because otherwise they're just worried about their bonus. They maximize revenue in one quarter, get the bonus, and uh, get promoted for the next, the next mission. But align to, to risk in the long term, and that we can use 
many instruments, and we, we are also we reinvent and research, you know, because we don't want to repeat the same mistakes that we've seen in other parts of the world. But if you don't have, you know, stock, you can use deferred cash, you can use uh, restricted stock, uh, you can use uh, stock options um, for long vesting period of time, and other instruments in order to recreate and synthesize this uh, ownership feeling so that uh, before you do any, uh, uh, let's say, uh, stupid move or, or anything that will hurt uh, the interests of the shareholders and the company or the employees, you think twice because you're aligned to that incentive. And regarding um, rating agencies, I think KPMG should uh, audit them as well. <laughs> well, uh, over the last uh, 45 minutes, we've had an opportunity to hear some I think very uh, thoughtful and cautiously but constructively optimistic perspectives uh, by sector, by uh, region, and also by time in terms of how we're actually collectively moving through this situation. It was interesting how we talked about the, the cause of this crisis being financial and actually some of the outstanding challenges in a sense are still financial. The, the role of the rating agencies, new models for actually providing uh, ways of connecting new pools with new demands for capital, and perhaps actually uh, new Latin America models. And then the fundamental issue of how actually one ca how one capitalizes and finances the ownership of, of corporations. And I think one of the, the key themes I take away is this issue of ownership, a broad sense of ownership, ensuring that it's not just an economic but a social impact to the society, but also that there's a long-term perspective and that there's ways of ensuring that managers and uh, shareholders somehow are engaged in the corporation itself being able to think through in a longer term perspective. So when we talk about sustainable development, it's not just sustainable development of economies or societies, but also what's the sustainable development models for corporations uh, going through challenging times as, as we're facing today. We've now come to the, the end of the session. Let me ask if there's any last comments that, that any uh, of the participants would like to make. Uh, if I may just tell, because I'm concerned that uh, somehow people start saying that we are against the capital market. Just to, to clarify, uh, what we say is that uh, the, the shareholders, the minority shareholders of the capital market, is a benefit when you have ownerships, ownership s sense, when you have long-term commitment in the companies they invest. That's what I'm saying. When all the ownership is diluted the capital market, no one is backed is taking care of those shareholders. So when you have a clear ownership, there's a long-term commitment, you have someone that is taking care of those shareholders, and the long term, they will go to win. That's what I just want to clarify. I, I was uh, very pleased to, to hear uh, President Lulu talk this morning about um, protectionism. And I thought it was a remarkable uh, comment that he made that protectionism is like taking a drug you know, in the short term, it makes you feel good, but in the long term, you, you have all sort of depression and problems. And this is uh, precisely what happened if you look back to the Great Depression. Uh, you know, we did in the U.S. everything possible, everything possibly we did was wrong. And today's economists are looking back on, on the, the Great Depression and saying we do not want to go, we don't want to have the protectionism because they, they put up tariff barriers, and so everybody else around the world put up tariff barriers, and so the U.S. couldn't export. They pretty much closed down the banks, they shut off capital, they raised income taxes, and, and it, it created an enormous, uh, you know, 10-year period for recovery. So I think clearly the idea of the stimulus packages that are going on right now are, are the right thing to do. The keeping, keeping the money flowing, uh, it's, it's also very important. The, one of the themes that came out this afternoon was that of ownership um, and really taking ownership for decisions. I think another theme that came out a lot was leadership. And I think you mentioned uh, the leadership that uh, the political leaders have been showing, uh, but also thoughtful, engaged, and positive leadership in the corporate sector as well. And I think there's no better uh, five examples than the panelists that had uh, with us here this afternoon. So please join me in, in thanking them for, for their engagement today. <laughs>